Hello class, we're going to continue with chapter 4 in the runestone book. We're going to cover for loops and the range function to complete this chapter. Now, you know, we talked last time about how we can make turtle objects and how we can move them, and we can move them around, and we could even create a, a little rectangle here, a square, actually. Uh, we can move forward, turn left, move forward, turn left, move forward, turn left, move forward, turn left, and that's very repetitive code. And, and whenever you write repetitive code, it's very likely that you can improve on it by reducing it in some way. So always look for that. Never be, yeah, never be happy with typing the same thing over and over and over again. Now, one way to quickly change things is by removing the hard-coded numbers. Uh, what I mean by hard-coded numbers are these numbers like 100 right here. It's not good to type these in. Suppose you wanted to change the size of your square from 100 to 50. You'd have to change each one of these to 50. And so by defining a variable instead and assigning the value to it, then we just have one place to change it uh, in all the different places. And it's a very nice way of, of handling that. Now we could do the same thing also with the degrees, and you know we make a variable for that as well. But, but we're still left with a lot of repetitive code. You know, this is repeated four times. And there must be a better way. I mean, suppose we wanted to print out, you know, hello a hundred times. Are we going to write it out a hundred times? No, no, we're not. And so in Python, and, and really all programming languages, there's always a method, a, a way of repeating the same set of statements over and over and over again. So we're going to be looking at the for loop in Python, which enables us to repeat a number of statements okay now the syntax for the for loop is starting with this keyword for having a loop variable and, and this is a variable that we get to make up however you as the programmer want to to call it this is a, a defined word in and then a colon at the very end so this colon these are our required pieces and the loop variable and the list are the programmer's choice. So here's, uh, let, let's give it a little example of this here. First off, we're going to execute line one. And when we execute line one, the, the variable i gets the value one. Then we go to line two and we print it out and we'll get an output of one. Then we run it again, or it, we loop back to instruction number one. And in this case, what happens is I will then get the value two. Then we go to line number two, execute it, and we print out the value four. Then we go back again to line one, and this time I gets the value of three. And then we go to line two and print it out. Then we go back one more time to line one, and I will now get the value of four. And then we go back to line two and print it out again. So you notice that this print statement, we just type it in one time, but it repeats itself four times. Now we could have additional prints, uh, additional statements here. We could have say line three and line four here. And so what happens is we execute lines two, lines three, lines four, then we go back to line one and the loop variable receives the next element in the list. Now, all these statements that are within the for loop, they must be indented. So you have to indent a certain amount for every single kind of statement that you want to repeat. Now, this indentation has to be the same amount and it's your choice as the programmer what you want to do um, I I like to do four spaces I know some programmers like to do two spaces but it's your choice but again they all have to be the same and that's the way in which Python knows which statements are the ones to repeat 
because then we could have a statement outside, say we have you know, this statement in red, when it's not indented, Python knows, okay, this is a statement that we do not repeat. This is outside of the for loop. And so we'll end up repeating these instructions here over and over and over again. And then when we're all done, we execute that statement right there. Okay, the loop variable is your choice. The list, what is a list? We haven't talked about what this is. Now, the list is a bunch of items, or another word we could say it's a bunch of objects. Again, everything in Python is an object. So we could have a list of any type of object we want. We need to put these kind of square brackets on both sides to indicate that it's a list. And then we separate the items with a comma. Now we could have integer objects, we could have string objects, we could have floating point objects. We could have turtles. We could put Alex in here. We could put expressions in here like x plus 5. All sorts of things can be put inside of a list. Okay, so now how do we use this for loop to, to simplify the code now? We notice that what, what we always want to recognize is what is my repeated code? So you notice I'm repeating these two lines over and over and over again. In fact, we're repeating it four times. So I'm going to take those two lines and I'm going to put it into a for loop, inside of a for loop. And then I'm going to create this, this list right here that has four items in it, which then makes this for loop repeat four times. So I will get the value of one and then we execute these two lines. I will get the value of two, then we execute these two lines. I will get the value of three, we execute the two lines. I will get the value of four, and then we execute the two lines one last time. Now, you notice that these values, one, two, three, and four, they don't matter here at all. The code doesn't care if it's a one, or if it's a two, if it's a three, or if it's a four. I just wanted four items inside of the list. So I could have put the number 10 here. I could have put a turtle as the second item. I could have put a floating point number as the third item. It didn't really matter as long as I had four items of any type inside of that list to create the iteration of four times. Okay, but suppose I wanted to print something a hundred times. I'm not going to be typing one comma two comma three comma four comma all the way up to a hundred to create the list that has a hundred items in it. That would be ridiculous. Um, so in Python, there's a way of creating those a list of that size. And, and this is the range function that we're going to be looking at now. And what it does is it's very useful um, to create a list of integers that we can use to iterate. The list of integers is basically an arithmetic sequence with a common difference. So if you've taken Algebra 2, you've heard about this idea of an arithmetic sequence. But even if you have not, it's, it's a very basic concept. Now, the range function takes three inputs. The starting number, the ending number, and the step value. Now, all of these values, they must be integers. So make sure you kind of take note of this. They must be integers, can't be floating point. So the first input tells us where do we start. So in this case here, we start with the value 1. The ending number tells us the sequence at the point which at which it ends. But the key thing is it's always before that ending value. And this is something you have to highlight. This is something you have to take, you know, kind of very ca careful care about. Because you see this number 11 right here? That says we do not go, we do not include 11 or we do not go beyond 11. So we stop 
before that number. So here the stepping value is 2. So we have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and we do not include the 11 um, because that matches the ending value right there. Okay? Key thing here. Okay, next example. We could also decrement. So the stepping value, the common difference, can be negative, which means our sequence goes down. So we could start at the number 20, decrement by negative 5, or decrement by 5, and stop before we get to the 0, which means we do not include the 0. Now, we don't always need to put three different inputs as parameters to the range function. It is legal to have only one. But if we only have one range of 10, what does the range of 10 mean? What it means is it's exactly the same as if we had written instead range 0, 10, 1. They're equivalent to each other. So it's implied that we start with the 0, we increment by 1, and we stop before we get to the number 10. So when we say range 10, we end up with a list of 10 items. So over here, this is a very convenient way now to loop 10 times. For i in range 10, we'll, we'll generate this list of 10 items which causes us to print this hello message 10 times. So that's what makes this very convenient to use. And, and in fact, this might be the most useful of all the different types of range, range statements that we have between this one up here, this one here, and this next one, which I'll talk about. Now this next one, next range function um, method, we, we could feed it two different inputs. So in that case, the first value is the starting value. The second parameter is the number, the ending value. So we don't go, we don't include the 10. We go up to 9, but not including the 10. So that means that the common stepping is always defined to be 1. Okay. So again, three different ways to use this range function. Three inputs, two inputs, or one input. Okay, for this try problem, I want you to do this on your own. I'm just, why don't you pause the video right now, and I'm going to count to three and show the answer. One, two, three. So this is one possible solution, and um, there, there's many. I, I could put right here the number negative 2, negative 3, all the way up to negative 10 as a way of making it stop at the 0 here. Okay, here's another problem. I want you to try this one as well. Pause the video. I'll show the answer in 1, 2, 3. Now, notice that this is repeating over and over and over again. So instead of typing this repeatedly, I'm going to put that into my for loop. So you can see that the repeating part gets copied right here. Now this part over here in purple is changing. So I, I can't, you know, put a 1 there or a 2 there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a variable there. And if my variable can be 1 the first time, and then 2 the next time, etc., all the way to 6, then it will automatically do this for me. So I could use a range function to generate the numbers from 1 up to 6, not including the 7. Okay, now I'm going to unroll a loop. I want to give you an example of how we unroll, which means get rid of the for loop. 
So I have, you know, the sum is equal to one is outside of the for loop. So certainly we just copy that. Now, how do I get rid of the for loop? Well, let me think about the range uh, function here and what numbers it's representing. It's representing the numbers one, three, five, seven, nine, not including the 10 again. The first time I execute this line, it's going to receive the value one. And so that's what I'm going to type here. N is equal to one as a replacement. Then we go to this next line of code right here. And so I'm just going to copy that right there. Then we go back to the for loop and N now gets the next value three. So I will type that right here N is equal to three. Then we go and type this line right there. We go back to the for statement and we'll get the next value five. So that's what we see here and copy this next line underneath that will get executed and so on and so forth. And in that manner, we have unrolled and gotten rid of the for loop. Now, let's also see how do we trace um, what's happening within the for loop. Um, what will be the value of sum when we're all done? So how we do this is I'm going to make a little table and I'm going to just execute line by line by line, line one, line two, line three. And whenever I see an assignment, whenever I see a variable changing, I'm going to update my table. So I'm going to start by executing line one. Line one says sum gets the value of one. Line two now, what happens the first time I execute it? N will get the value of one. So I'll write that down. Then I execute line three, and this says that sum gets a new value. It gets the value of one plus one. So that will be updated to two. And, and I could cross out the old value because it, it's not that value anymore. Okay, then what happens? I go back to line two. N will receive the next value, three. I now execute line three again. Sum gets replaced with a new value, sum plus n. So I need to add up the two and the three. We go back to line two. N will get a new value. N will get the value five this time. Execute line three again. Add up these two numbers, five plus five. Go back to line two again. And we'll get now the value of seven. Add them up. One more time and gets the value of nine. We add it up. Okay. So at the very end, after we've done all of the execution of the code, sum will have the value of 26. Okay. I want you to try this on your own. Again, why don't you pause the video right now? Give it a try. And I'm going to explain the answer in one, two, three. Okay, here is the unrolled code. You notice how the first time num gets the value of zero, so I'll put that here. Then I just copy this line over. Num then gets the value of one, right there. Copy the next line over, etc., etc. Notice that we stop at three because it's a range of four, so we stop before the four. Okay, let's trace this now and see what happens. Let's label the line numbers. We have line one, line two, line three, line four. We start by executing line one. A is equal to one. Now we go to line two. B is equal to two. Now we execute line three. Num gets the value of zero. Then we execute line four and it says, add those three values up. I get the value three. And so B now changes to a brand new value. Okay, now I go back to line three. I loop, I, I loop back. Num gets the next value, one. Execute line four. I need to add up the three variables. One plus one plus now three, that's gonna be five. I go back to line three, num gets the next value two. 
go to line four to execute line four, add up the three variables, two plus one plus five is eight. Go back to line three one more time, num gets the value of three, execute line four, add up the three numbers, three plus one plus eight is 12. Okay, you notice I didn't rewrite a, you know, a never changed, a was equal to one at the very top, so I just, I just left it the same. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Have a good day, everybody.